This is a horrible doctrine and a borderline blasphemous, if not outright blasphemous teaching. And so I want to make a sincere appeal to those who teach this. One of the worst, and I do mean one of the most absolute worst teachings that you can find out there, and it's being propagated by a lot of people. And I say that, and I'm not trying to be mean or ugly, but I think that these people need to do a better job of understanding the scriptures, reading the scriptures, and not promoting something that is anti-biblical. And that particular teaching or doctrine is this whole issue about generational curses, that, that we can be saved and be under a curse. Think about that. How does a Christian have the love of the Lord in them, have Christ in them, have placed their faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit is in them, they've been saved, they've been set free, they've been redeemed, they've been delivered, because that's really what the word comes from. They have been they have been made free indeed, but they're really not free indeed. They have Christ, they have the Holy Spirit, they have joy, or to have joy, but they're also under a curse. How can you be under a curse and have joy? How can you be under a curse and live with confidence? How can you be under a curse and be used by the Lord? Who gives a curse? Who causes the curse? Where does the curse come from? And I've had this challenge, and this is where I'm asking those people that believe these texts. And oh, by the way, I'm going to send these to as many, this video and this question to as many people as possible that I know of or can get in contact with who promote this. My question is, can you give a legitimate biblical basis. I'm not talking about allegorizing text. I've seen this done in 1 John. I, I thought it was an absolute horrible rendition of the text. There, that's not what the, That is not what this word says at all. That's not what the scripture says at all, equating what's stated in 1 John. And I won't use this because I, I don't want to make it seem as though I'm calling out the particular people and more than one people have used this text. As a matter of fact, there's another text that people use often to say that you can have generational curses. So my question is, my sincere, honest question, because I don't want to see it as though I am attacking or name calling, so I'm not going to even use their names or faces, but I'm going to ask them, could you please show us, could you please tell us how you get this out of the text? There is no such thing, let me repeat, no such thing as a generational curse. The question you have to find out and figure out is what does the word curse mean anywhere in scripture, whether it be the Old Testament or the New Testament? The word curse simply means to either lightly esteem or to think neg negatively of, uh, to loathe, to think bad of, and then obviously to treat that way. Well, if that's what it means, and that is what it means, be it the Hebrew or the Greek, then it certainly matters who loathes you. Who thinks of you lightly or esteems you lightly, thinks of you in a negative fashion and then treats you that way? For example, if I have pronounced a curse upon you, well, what's that going to do? I have no power. I could just think negatively of you. The worst that I could do is possibly make a video of it, make some tweets or or some Twixes, Twitter, X Twixes. I can do that. That's the best that I can do. But I don't have the power to make your life um, bad. Now, I can do some illegal things. And then, of course, I'll get cursed by the United States government for breaking the law and then they will think of me lightly or esteem me lightly or loathsome and then put me in jail, treat me that way. But that's not a curse. And it's certainly not a generational curse. Where does this idea of a generational curse come from? Now, it's not to say that there was never been a such thing as a generational curse. Where we get that from is there's this old proverb. Let's pull up. Let's go to the Old Testament and let's go to, <clears throat> excuse me, let's go to um, Jeremiah 31. 27. It's brought up here. As I have watched over them, I'm sorry, let's go to, uh, I want to start, yeah, verse 27. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will sow the house of Israel and the house of Judah with the seed of man and with the seed of beast. As I have watched over them to pluck up, to break down, to overthrow, to destroy, and to bring disaster. So, now he's speaking of all that he's done to them. Look what he says. So I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. And here it is. In those days, they will not say again because they're saying now he's repeating a proverb. It's a true proverb, but the time is going to come when this proverb will not be true. He says in those days, they will not say again that the fathers have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. In other words, the children's teeth are settled in because of the father's sin. This is a generational curse 
because of what God is doing. And with, who is this generational curse with? Notice this curse was not with Israel. This curse is I mean, with, with, with those outside of Israel. This curse is for and with Israel. He says, but everyone will die of his own iniquity. Each man who eats the sour grapes, his teeth will be set on edge. And so what happens in the family, what happens to the father or the fathers, particularly of Israel, won't be revisited upon each successive generation. If you are under some sort of consequences, they will be because of your own. Now, can there be some lingering consequences from one generation to the next? Sure, this father was inattentive to money and was not frugal and spent like a drunken sailor. Uh, will that child learn some bad lessons and maybe use those same things in practice? Sure. Does that mean that he can't overcome those things because he's under a curse? Because if you're under a curse, the issue is you can't do anything about it. If God curses you, there's nothing that can be done. Notice when God brings up this issue about Abraham, he says, if anyone curses you, I will curse them. God is the one that can do a curse. So if anyone treats you, thinks of you a certain way and treats you that way because they have cursed you, it's not one, it's not a generational curse. But two, if they want to keep implementing, well, then as far as Abraham is concerned, then God will step in and deal with it. Now, if God has cursed you, there's nothing that can be done about that. And if there's a generational curse, such as that was on Israel, only God can fix that. And so what was God's resolution to that? Well, what was the solution? That that will not happen coming forward at the advent of the new covenant. Days will come when everyone will die for his own iniquity. Each man's teeth will be set on edge because of his own sin, not because of his father or his forefathers. We don't see that going forward in the New Testament at all. And so I've made this claim even on a recent panel. Someone, please give me a passage. What they do is they go to this passage and they say, well, I think this means this. Let me give you an example of one particular passage. And this is where it would just help, especially, and I said this before, if you are a pastor, especially if you're a pastor, or if you're a teacher and you've got some sort of influence, then it would be helpful if you knew some of the languages, some of the Hebrew, some of the Greek. It would be because you wouldn't make these elementary, I think elementary mistakes, and you wouldn't ex you wouldn't exegete improperly. Rather, what we're seeing is eisegeting. And here's a classic example. And I've heard virtually everyone that believes in generational curses, I've heard them eisegete this particular check this particular text. You've heard uh, in Ephesians 4:27 and give no uh, give the devil no place or no opportunity. Let's let's go up further. Let's read it. Therefore, laying aside falsehoods, speak truth, uh, each one of you with his neighbors, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil a place or give place to the devil. Uh, or my translation says opportunity. Well, look at the context of this. The context has nothing to do with a generational curse. This is where it becomes just obviously and easily sophomore and just uh, it's unbiblical to make the leap, to make the statement that this is speaking about a generational curse. What's the, the context here? And what they do is they harp on a particular word, which is why I say if you're going to do this, at least have some understanding of Greek and how it's used. They, 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 they uh, kind of glom on this particular word here for opportunity or in your translation you might say place well the word is tapas or tapon does that ever refer to an actual geographic location sure it's where we get the word topography from in english but does it always mean that no as a matter of fact in many cases it doesn't mean that so let me give you some examples let's go over here to to logos i want to pull this up and i want you to see a couple of these examples uh here in uh let's start in luke 2 7 Here's an example of this passage actually relating to uh, an actual location. So it does refer to location, but there are also times where it refers to not a location, but it refers to an actual opportunity or place. For example, what does it say here in Hebrews 8, 7? He says, for if the first covenant had been faultless, there would be no occasion sought for a second. Well, the word that's used here for occasion, if we drop down, let's pull down to the next part. If you look at verse seven, it's the word tapas. Now, is it looking for a location? No, this is for uh, the word occasion. And so it would be difficult to always use the word tapas to say that tapas means a place. Tapas has to be an actual geographic location. How about another passage? Let's go to... Um, Acts 25. Let's start in 
Let's start in verse 15. And so he says, when I was at Jerusalem, the chief and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. It was verse 16. I answered them uh, it was that it was or that it is the, the custom of the Romans. Look what it says. It was the custom of the Romans to hand over any man before the accused meets his accuser face to face and has an opportunity to make his defense against the charges. Well, what's the word that's used here for opportunity? The Greek word that's used here is the word tapas here in this particular passage as well. So you could not keep saying that when you see this word tapas, that it means that. Let's go back to this other passage. Let's go over here. Matter of fact, let's put it back on this screen because I want you to see it uh, really clearly. So this word for tapas, the word for opportunity, is the word tapon here in the Greek. Same thing in Romans 12. In Romans 12, 19, he says, never take your own revenge, beloved, but leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. Now, the word that's used here for room is not referring to an actual space, an actual room, even though the word that's top on here, it means leave opportunity, a place for the Lord. This is not leave this actual geographic location right here because it's the actual geographic location that God is going to take vengeance. It's giving God opportunity to do so. And so to use this word, to misuse this word, one is either intentionally or or ignorantly. Neither of those are acceptable. So if you are ignorantly using this Ephesians 4 passage, give no place to the devil, and you think it means an actual location, a foothold, you are incorrect just grammatically. If you're doing so ignorantly, you need to come about and fix this. If you're doing so intentionally, well, then now God is going to deal with you. And we have to also make sure that folks know that that's not acceptable. That's not what that means. I'll get to that in just a second why this is not acceptable. But then we need to talk about what an actual curse is. Paul brings up and speaking about a curse uh, and he's speaking about these Judaizers coming to these to these Gentiles and trying to place them under the curse that they may have found themselves in under the law. Let's go to Galatians 3, starting verse 10. He says, for many, for as many as are the works of the law are under a curse. So those people that want to live according to the law, they are under a curse. Why? Now, notice it's not a generational curse. And again, what does the word curse mean? This cursing refers to, it refers to a loathsome view, thinking lightly, esteem lightly in a negative fashion, and then treating this way. Now, in this case, God is going to treat the person individually who wants to be under the law as though they're under curse. Why? For it is written, cursed is everyone who who does not abide by all the things in the book of the law to perform them. So if you're going to abide by the law, you've got to abide by all of that. Now, what happens if you don't abide by all of it? Well, then you are guilty of all of it, which means you are cursed. By who? By God. Is this a generational curse? No. You can go to hell. Your children don't have to. You can go to hell. Your grandchildren don't have to. Or your parents could be going to hell. Your great, great, great grandparents might be in hell. Doesn't mean that you will be. It's not a generational curse. This is what, what, what the writer of Jeremiah says to those Jews that from now on, the children's teeth will be set on edge because they ate sour grapes. Not They will be accountable for their own sin. Let's continue. Verse 11. Now that no one is justified by the law, before God is evident. So the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not a faith. On the contrary, he who practiced them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us. Look what it says. Christ redeemed us, that is those believers, from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. So how was Christ treated uh, on the cross? He was esteemed lightly. He was esteemed as and viewed as loathsome and treated that way. He became the sin bearer for us. He says that um, curse is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we will receive the promise of the spirit through faith. And so through Abraham, this is going back to Genesis 12, 3, that through him, all of those, all of the families of the earth each family of the earth can be blessed. But if you're going to live by the law, then you're going to live by the curse of the law, which means you have to keep all of it. But is it a generational curse? No, it's not. And this is where it becomes something that is really, I think, borderline blasphemous, if not outright blasphemous, to take away what Christ has done, the work of the Spirit in a person. Let's go and see something that, that Jesus himself says, and let's try to make this fit with this misconception of 
a generational curse. Jesus says in John 8, 36, he says, so if the son makes you free, you will be free in Indeed. Well, the word for indeed is a Greek word, antos, which is thoroughly, completely, indeed, really. You are really free. But when someone comes back and says, no, Jesus, they're not really free. That's a lie. That person has a curse because you can't be free and have a curse. You can have a curse and have actually have been redeemed. So those two statements are contrary. And so my question is, I could be wrong, but show me how you can actually be free indeed and be under curse. And oh, by the way, here's the next statement. If a person's under curse, how can you free that person from the curse? You don't have that power, especially saying that Jesus also himself didn't have the power. The Holy Spirit that's in them doesn't have the power to free a person from the curse, but you say the person has a curse. What this is, ladies and gentlemen, as far as I can see, and I'm going to ask for someone to correct me, I could be wrong, but what I see is this constant misdiagnosis of a problem. That is to say that this person or these people have a issue with a curse. It's either a demon or a curse. And I can renounce that. I would love to see how I would love to see someone showing in the New Testament where generational curses were done away with by either by an apostle or prophet or anyone. Show us where a generational curse was gotten rid of because Paul or Peter or James or John or whomever else laid hands on that person and that person's family was no longer under a curse. And there will be those that will look for examples where, for example, a whole family might have been saved. For example, the jailer, he and his whole household were saved. Well, a couple of things. One, we don't know if the children, if that, that included children uh, and his grandchildren and so forth, it doesn't mean that everywhere, every time in that person's life that all of his children are going to be saved and that he was actually under curse. First of all, it doesn't say that he was under a curse. That's just simply that they heard the gospel. They they placed their faith in Christ. He and his whole household it doesn't mean that everybody in his household uh, got saved. Well, those that lived in his household, possibly. But what about his grandchildren, great grandchildren or his cousins? No, just those that are there. And it does not state uh, that they were under a curse to begin with. They were not. And so if to say so, because I've seen people do this as well, now that person is classically and incorrectly exegeting a text, putting something in the text that does not belong. And so when we pull this up in Acts 16, 34 or 33, he says he took him that very night and washed their wounds and immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced greatly, having believed with God, with his whole household. It doesn't say that there was ever a curse there, that there was a generational curse. Being saved does not mean that you're under uh, that you were formerly under a generational curse. Well, but wait a second, Corbin, but isn't the whole planet under a curse that is that we will all die? Well, first of all, everybody won't die. So therefore, that nullifies the thought that everyone is under some sort of generational curse. And by the way, it's not a generational curse issue. It's not that because we're all going to eventually go to the dirt, we're going to eventually die, that we are under a generational curse, meaning that that can be uplifted. It's because of what my forefathers did. Well, if you want to say that Adam, that's fine. But again, everybody won't all die. There are going to be some people Now, when this happens, don't know, but there are going to be some people that will never taste physical death. So therefore, it could not be a generational curse. And again, if it were a generational curse, if physical death were in the category of a generational curse, one, the Bible didn't say so, but two, how then when you guys would say that you can renounce a curse or uh, uh, cast out a curse or whatever it is that you do, why isn't that curse done away with? Because it's not a generational curse and you don't have the power over it anyway. Again, if there is a curse, it would necessarily have to come from or be dealt with by the person who offered the curse. And if it's not Jesus, then it doesn't matter. You can curse me all you want. You can say what you want all you want. As a matter of fact, we see Peter doing so when he offers up a curse for himself. When Peter is denying Jesus, notice what Peter does. Verse 74 of Matthew 26, he says, then he began to curse and swear. That's not, it's not, we take this as uh, using cuss words or profanity. No, this is him pronouncing a curse upon himself. I don't know the man and immediately a rooster crow. So now look what Peter is doing. Peter is saying this almost like, I don't, I swear to God, I don't know the man. Cross my heart, hope to die, stick a needle in my eye. This is him pronouncing a curse upon himself. However, could Peter curse himself? Is this a legitimate curse? No, because what did Jesus already tell him? He says that you will deny me 
but when you return. And so Jesus already spoken about what was going to happen with Peter. So he couldn't even curse himself. Again, it depends on who's doing the cursing. And spiritually speaking, if it's God, well, then if God has cursed you, there's nothing that you can do. All of these statements about some sort of heavenly legal decrees, uh, fine. Give us a passage. Give us a text that says that this is what's happened in heaven, that heaven has issued this legal injunction or legal decree or things like that, things of those nature. Show us the passage. Or are you doing what Paul's saying? Are you exceeding what the text says? And I'm not saying you're doing so intentionally or ignorantly. I don't know. But if you're doing so and you see that's not the past, that's not correct, then I would hope, I would assume, I'll give you the benefit of the doubt that you'll see the error and correct that. If you would even, if you repent publicly or privately, just state that, you know what, I was wrong. I was in error. There are no generational curses. People write books about it. People have videos about it. People have uh, conferences about it, have these long discussions about it. How could there be? Either you're free, set free, because remember what Jesus said he came to do? He's come to set the captives free. Uh, well, he didn't, did he, if you're under a generational curse? So my question, I am legitimately asking, show us that there is a such thing. And if so, show us how you come to that conclusion, how a person can be alleviated from that, how this can no longer be an issue in our lives, or also these heavenly uh, decrees, these uh, legal judgments and so forth. Where does that come from? Give us the text. Please don't allegorize a text, but show us. As a matter of fact, even if you do want to allegorize a text, show us that so we can see for ourselves. If we're wrong, well then fine, at least we know the truth. But if you're wrong, would you also be willing to say I was wrong? And it cannot be that I'm not going to listen to you no matter what you say. That is not godly. It's not biblical. It's not mature to state that no matter what a person says about what you have based your ministry on or, or your current thought pattern on, that you can't be shown the truth. Because if that's the case, then throw your Bible away. You have no need of it because now you have superimposed what you think and what you feel over the scriptures. I can never, and I hope to never be in a position where I can say, it doesn't matter what you show me. I'm not going to believe. No. So you mean to me if I show you the possibility of you being wrong with the scriptures or ask you to show, because if it's that important, it should be that important, whether it's for you to uh, get a view to get a new book sold, to get a new click, to get this or that or what have you. I want to know the truth. The truth is what sets us free. If you will know the truth, then the truth can make us free. And so if there's some truth that, that we just don't know and you've uncovered, well then fine, show us. And then also tell us why the Bible didn't give us the same revelation that you have, why it took you all of these years to be the one to come up with this particular revelation. And so again, I'm not sharing any faces any names. Some of you all may already have some names and faces in mind, but I can promise you there are hundreds of people in this country and all over the globe who feel and believe in generational curses. I'm asking any and every one of them, if they hear this or you know someone, or if you believe this, give us the scriptures, give us the text. Why? Because it's that important. We should not have believers who have placed their faith in Christ walking around feeling defeated because they feel they are under a curse when Jesus is their Lord. So if you would all uh, be so kind as to help, help a brother out, help me understand the truth, or be honest and say, I've gotten this wrong, or I might have to do some more research on the matter. But we cannot have people being put in bondage, because that's literally what's happened. People being put in bondage for this thought that they are under a curse. It is what I said before, it is a mental bondage. If it's not true, it's a mental bondage to think that you have a problem. We have these people who are hypochondriacs who think that they are sick. They're really not. We now have spiritual hypochondriacs who think that they are under some sort of spiritual sickness, not of any result of their own doing, but because their family uh, has done so, or they've opened up a door or they've opened up a gateway, a portal to let the enemy in. Again, how can that be? Greater is he, that's the spirit of God, that's the Lord who's in me than he that's in the world. But yet I'm under a curse. Give me a text. Possibly I've got some pages missing or I haven't read something correctly. Show us, help us out. I'm asking you because you are now biblically required to answer this question, to help us, to give a defense of the hope that's in you 
me, me the same way, please do so so that we can all uh, relish and love and share in the goodness of the Lord together, that we can all live free. Amen. Amen.